you can ask questions. And there may be the questions in the YouTube channel. So in that case, I still read it for you, the questions, mm -hmm. a question from the YouTube channel. Okay. So let me start by introducing you. Well, so welcome to this uh, post launch session. And it is truly, truly my great pleasure to introduce the today's speaker, Professor Quake from University Singapore. And Professor Quake is very, very well known to our field. And he's currently a professor at Center for Quantum Technologies, National University of Singapore. And he's also a co-director of the Quantum Science and Engineering Center at Nanong Technology University of Singapore and current Deputy Secretary General of the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics Singapore. Apart from his, this and the current administrative positions, he has also served as a director or co-director of many national and international physical societies. <laughs> and he was also a, a Fujitsu visiting professor at Cambridge University in 2004. His primary research interests are in quantum foundations, quantum information theory, uh, in particular the multipartite quantum entanglement, quantum cryptography, quantum synchronization, quantum network, quantum computation, uh, quantum machine learning, and many more. <clears throat> Professor Quake has published uh, uh, more than 300 research articles in high impact factor journals with a number of papers, many number of papers in nature photonics, nature communication, physical regulators, review modern physics, and so on. And he's the PI or co-PI of uh, numerous research projects, totaling around $23.7 million. And he has supervised more than 25 PhD students and he's he's recipient of many national and international awards to name a few the institute of physics award uh, institute of physics president award singapore national science award of singapore and many more he's also an elected fellow of american association of advancement of science institute of physics uk and institute of physics singapore he is currently an associate editor of the journal of quantum evs quantum science and the physical review a and he also served as an editor of Entropy and the International Journal of Quantum Information Science. With these words, I welcome Professor Quake again and invite him to deliver his lecture. Thank you. Thanks, Alan, okay. for the uh, kind introduction. So let me share my slides. to share. Yes, we can see it. You see the slides? Yes, yes, full screen. Please go on. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So um, uh, again, th thanks again for the invitation to this uh, conference. It's long, it's a very long conference. I am quite sure that the organizer uh, will find it very tiring uh, at the end of the conference, and happily that's in sight. Um, primarily because I organized a two-week conference recently online, and uh, I I find it really taxing, at least on my time. <laughs> so uh, congratulations to the organizer for their perseverance in this such a long conference. Uh, today, I'm going to briefly introduce you to uh, quantum computer in this NIS era. And for, for reasons, I'll introduce what is NIS later on. Uh, well, maybe I'll just say NIS just means noisy intermediate scale quantum computer. So uh, uh, it was a term that was coined by John Preskill a couple of uh, years ago. And uh, I'll come back to that later on. But let me... Uh, do a gentle introduction to uh, computing as a history of computing. So mankind has always been fascinated with computing. The abacus, for example, is one of the earliest tools. Uh, and it was also reputed to be used by the Romans uh, in some form. Uh, and for those of you who are old enough to, uh, to learn physics uh, at some stage, uh, you will realize that uh, in school, at the beginning, we use a lot of slide rule. So this is this device up here, uh, the slide rule. And the slide rule, in fact, was uh, perhaps one of the most useful tools that was invented, but it was uh, essentially a calculating machine. 
uh, it is in fact uh, the uh, end result of what's sometimes called the Napier rod. Now, uh, one of the oldest reputedly uh, uh, computer uh, is actually um, a, com a, a small device, uh, not larger perhaps than our laptop, that is built by the Greeks 2,000 years ago. It was uh, discovered near Antikyra Island in Greece, and uh, subsequently it was called the Antikyra machine. And um, I have a video here. I don't think I will play it completely, and I'm not even sure if you'll hear the sound. Uh, let me check. Uh, maybe I unshare. I may need to unshare. I'll stop sharing. Uh, and then I share again, share sound. Uh, yeah, because I forgot to share sound. I'm not going to play this. You can get it from the YouTube. Anyway, I steal it from YouTube. And so uh, I could have a link to that. If it hadn't been discovered so this is a BBC was in 1901, program. no one would possibly believe that it could exist. I hope it's you hear so the, sophisticated. the sound. This Are mechanism you? would be remarkable even if it was a less clever thing than it is. This is the story of one of the most extraordinary finds in history. This corroded bronze object is a machine that can look into the future. It was built 2,000 years ago in ancient Greece. Somebody somewhere in ancient Greece built an extraordinary machine that was actually a mechanical computer. A hundred years ago, a group of divers chanced upon a wreck full of the largest hoard of ancient Greek treasures ever found. Among the priceless ancient Greek bronze sculptures is another bronze object, no bigger than a modern laptop. It's known as the Antikythera mechanism. As a team of scientists try to unravel the secrets of the Antikythera mechanism, we are taken on a journey that charts the fall of one great right, ancient so empire. I'll stop there, and you can hear the rest of the story. It's an hour-long movie uh, uh, or broadcast from the BBC station. But the real computer that we now know about uh, didn't stem from the Antikythera machine. It was actually a Babbage machine. And Charles Babbage said that he was sitting in the uh, uh, in the rooms at the Analytical Society in Cambridge. And then it gives on him the idea that perhaps he could invent a machine that could uh, compute uh, log tables in some sense. And but they wasn't very welcome at that time, and uh, he was, in fact, given a grant by uh, the British Prime Minister at that time, Sir Robert Peel, said that, what shall we do to get rid of Mr. Babbage and his calculating machine? Surely, surely if it's completed, it would be worthless as far as science is concerned. However, so not many people, especially the politicians, the many other scientists, they don't appreciate Babbage machine. But there was a lady who did, and that lady was actually a niece of uh, Lord Byron, um, uh, Ida Lovelace. And what she said was that the analytical machine does not occupy common grounds with mere calculating machines. In enabling, me in enabling mechanisms to come back together, general symbols, in successions are a limited variety and extent. A uniting link is established between the operations of matter and the abstract mental process of the most abstract branch of mathematical science. Basically, what she's saying is that it is the computer we know today. Now, in fact, the, the Babbage machine contains the rudiments of the modern computer. Um, it has the input device, it has a control unit, 
and there's an output mechanism. In, in fact, it has even a memory, a central processor, which is a fundamental feature of the current computer. And more importantly, it has a programming language equivalent to the assembly language. And in fact, other loveless uh, note that um, it may not be obvious to Charles Babbage at that time that it was such a wonderful machine. Uh, but of course, that machine gave rise to early ideas on how to, uh, to build a calculating machine. And that led us to many, many uh, uh, improvements over the years and prior to uh, 1940s, prior to the invention of the, uh, the transistor, uh, there were efforts made towards uh, uh, many such machines. The punch card was uh, invented and subsequently the row. Okay. So what happened? Yes, so that, sorry. So, so that lets us currently with the, the rise of the transistor, that led us to the integrated machine and to our current computer. And for those of us who are old enough to see the rise of the computer, you see that uh, in the 80s, the computer that we know of were the uh, IBM 286, for example, were, uh, were really uh, no comparison compared to our current uh, uh, um, uh, iPhone uh, as a machine, as a device. But this was uh, this all these were possible with the invention of the transistor. So other computers came into existence. The Harvard Mark One, in fact, as a juice machines, uh, uh, a machine that was built in Germany around the same period. Uh, not going to the history of that. So as most of us note, uh, there is this uh, 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 Moore's law that says that from the Babbage machine that we know of uh, years ago, we eventually comes to, uh, uh, to the atomic scale and at the atomic scale, then we should not see the same physics happening. And this is uh, the traditional uh, reasoning for why we need computer. So just a little bit of uh, deviation now on what a quantum computer is compared to a classical computer. And a classical computer, of course, makes use of current, and it can be in the state zero, meaning low current, and state one, meaning high current. And uh, that can be represented in atomic scale by energy levels. So it could be in the S orbital and the P orbital, for example. And uh, one of the important thing in quantum mechanics is, or quantum theory is that uh, you see uh, uh, a phenomena like this picture, which I traditionally take as uh, a good analogy. Uh, so what do you see in this particular picture? Do you see a young lady or an old lady? And uh, some people say they do. They see an old lady smiling or a young lady with a head turn. So uh, which is it? Well, it all depends on how you focus. So if you if you treat this and you raise this a little bit, and you'll see a young lady with a head turn. But if you focus exactly on this as a mouth of an old lady, then you will see the old lady. But that reminds us of quantum mechanical principle, the fundamental principle that any measurement in itself destroy this, this uh, superposed state. So quantum state, uh, uh, unlike classical system, quantum system can be in a superposition of zeros and one, and therefore you see this, uh, this, this uh, anomaly. And another uh, picture that I typically use is this one. Uh, it's exactly the same thing, two in one. What do you see? Do you see a person looking at you or do you see a person looking to the right? And well, again, it depends on what you focus on and typically, when you do focus on and get one of the picture, then you lose the other picture. But it's of course a classical analogy. So, uh, corresponding to a quantum, uh, uh, corresponding to a classical computer that operates on 
the information 0, 1, 1, meaning low current, high current, high current, uh, it, uh, the, the, the equivalent would now be uh, uh, S orbiter, P orbiter, P orbiters. But because uh, an atom can exist as both uh, P and S orbiters, then it becomes some blurb, blurb, blurb. And what does this blurb means? Well, it depending on your measurement, you are going to get a whole list of state from 0, 0, 0 all the way to 1, 1, 1. Of course, all this occurs with equal probability. And then you subject all these states to a machine and the machine computes a function uh, based on 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1. And then uh, you get all the answers at the same time. But of course, you don't get all the answers at the same time because when you do a measurement, it collapses into one of these answers. And, and then of course, um, you don't really get an answer in that sense. But of course, you can then have another device that do constructive and destructive interference. And that constructive and destructive interference would gear the superposed state to one of the particular state, which ends up as your answer. So this is, uh, is a schematic diagram of how a quantum computer would compute uh, versus a classical computer. A classical computer computes all the zeros, the function values, but a quantum computer does do it all in superposition. John Preston, in a recent paper, says that uh, quantum computers have the capabilities of surpassing classical computers. Uh, and he lists three points. The first point is that quantum algorithms uh, are typically believed, uh, there, are tip, there are algorithms that are typically believed to be hard for classical computers. And yet we have quantum algorithms that can solve some of these problems. And one example is, which I'll mention later on, uh, factorization, prime number factorization uh, appears to be hard on the classical computer, appears because we do not know a classical computer uh, computing algorithm that uh, can uh, do better. So, um, so we have we do have an uh, uh, an example of a classically difficult uh, algorithm for classical computer, but not so much for a quantum computer, if it exists. A complexity argument: the theoretical computer science have provided complexity theory. That quantum states, which are easy to prepare with quantum, have super classical properties. So if you measure all the qubits in a state, we are sampling from a correlation, a related probability that cannot be sampled uh, by uh, any efficient classical means. So a quantum computer will produce uh, this probability distribution that are difficult to be sampled with any efficient uh, classical computer. And finally, of course, that it is not known that there is any classical algorithm that can simulate a quantum computer. So based on these three, uh, John Preskill expressed optimism about the capabilities of a quantum computer. So let me go uh, briefly into the quantum algorithms. Uh, uh, there is now a zoo of quantum algorithms. You can get this zoo from a compilation by uh, uh, Stephen Jordan, but uh, there are other comp compilations. Now, briefly, uh, uh, a partial list of quantum algorithm, of course, is, is a Deutsch algorithm. A uh, Deutsch algorithm was, was invented by David Deutsch in 1985. And then that was subsequently generalized to the Deutsch Jossa algorithm and then to the Shaw algorithm, which is the algorithm that factorizes prime number. And uh, in the process of discovering Shaw algorithm, there were phase uh, estimation. I actually got this slide from Mang Hong, uh, who gave a talk recently in Singapore. And um, and then the Grover search algorithms. Uh, but uh, I've added uh, a bernstein vazirani algorithm, which was invented just shortly before uh, deutsch joss algorithm. And also uh, around the same time, uh, Simon algorithm, which account for uh, the reason why B 
Peter Shaw uh, invented his algorithm. And in fact, if you go to YouTube, you will be able to uh, listen directly to the words of, uh, of uh, Peter Shaw, who, 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 who tells you historically about how he came up with the idea of prime number factorization on a quantum computer. And of course, uh, the last few algorithms um, uh, um, we have is in 2009, Seth Loy and together with Aram Haro and uh, Hasidim uh, discover what's called the an algorithm using quantum computer for solving uh, a set of linear equations. And that was followed rapidly by a series of works on quantum machine learning, which works, which uses the HHL algorithm, and then uh, followed by a proposal which was uh, partly invented by the Harvard quantum chemistry team, of which Mang Hong was a, a part of the member, uh, the variational quantum eigensolver and the quantum approximation algorithm. Um, so uh, in the process, of course, we have a quantum Fourier transform, which laid the foundation for many of this algorithm. The Deutsch algorithm is a very simple algorithm. It's an algorithm that essentially uh, distinguish uh, whether a function uh, is, um, so if you, if you look at, uh, sorry, if you look at a function that maps zero, one to zero, one, then either the function is, um, uh, both function values are zero or both functional values are one which we say is typically a constant function, or you have um, an algorithm in algorithm of a third function uh, in which f of zero is zero and f of one is uh, one, or the other way around, f of one, f of zero is one and f of one is zero. And the whole idea is how do you distinguish constant and balance? Now, classically, of course, you compute f of zero, you compute f of one, and then you compare. So you need two computations, if you like, or two measurements. Now, quantum mechanically, you can uh, shortcut this procedure. And the shortcut of this procedure is that you start off with a state zero, one, and that's the algorithm. And you allow it to, the zero to go to Hadamard and the one to go to Hadamard. And then you perform a unitary F. This is a control F uh, gate. And it turns out that uh, at this stage, at this juncture, uh, um, the, the, um, this, this uh, second bit, which is the one bit, doesn't really matter. Uh, the, first, the first bit is started off with zero. After going through the Hadamard, it becomes an equal superposition of zero and one. So basically, uh, this allow us to uh, compute both zero and one at the same time. But um, one of the interesting thing about Deutsch algorithm, which I like to comment if we can uh, go deeper into it, and typically I need a short book for, uh, for that, is, is that uh, you, you need an ancillary, but the ancillary doesn't participate in the computation. It sort of drops out at the end. So this sort of catalytic or enzymic uh, properties is uh, something that is uh, has been investigated, but I think there is still room for investigation. So Deutsch algorithm allows us to, uh, with this procedure, it allows us to distinguish between constant and balanced function in one measurement. So that means that we have uh, reduced the complexity from two to one. But two to one, as you might think, is not fantastic. And uh, 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 certainly uh, is not fantastic. But then if you think about uh, the, the generalization, which is uh, if you have n qubits, then you have two to the n input points, but the, the mapping is still to zero and one, then you would still want to con consider a function that is either constant, all the points mapping to zero or all the points mapping to one, then classically you will need two to the n divided by two plus one. So it's an exponential order when the number of points uh, increases, uh, but quantum mechanically, you still need 
uh, 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 quantum mechanically, you, you in the worst case scenario, you need n number of measurements. And so this is a great improvement. You have gone from two to the n to n. So in, in, in some sense, it's a, it's a technical exercise that shows that you can simplify something from uh, exponential to, to polynomial. But it's, of course, to a large extent, uh, a useless algorithm. One of the more useful algorithm is Simon's algorithm. Uh, and what Simon's algorithm does is that uh, it has, let's say we consider a 0, 0, 0, uh, all the way to 111 is a three qubit system or three bit system, if you like. And you XOR it with some constant number. So 0, 0, 0 will become 0, 1, 0, and, and so forth. Then you find that there is a mapping. Uh, two of these are actually mapped to the same point. The functional value for 0, 0, 0 and 0, 1, 0 are exactly the same. We assume that there is such a function such that f of x and f of x plus some, some constant 0, 1, 0 are the same. Then effectively the, the question, the problem is when you find this uh, value and Simon algorithm allow you to find this value. It is important uh, historically because uh, as Peter Shaw said, uh, this algorithm allows him to find, to generalize it to find period. And in fact, in, in the process, he also discover Fourier, quantum Fourier transform. So this, this is, uh, is a big breakthrough uh, in, in concept, uh, conceptually. And uh, I'll not go through the algorithm, nor the circuits, but it can be done. And, and simplistically, you can go through the simple calculation and you'll find that it boils down to uh, uh, measuring uh, 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 the uh, uh, even with n qubits, you are just solving uh, n unknowns in n equations and by inspection sometimes. Okay, I'll skip this. Sorry. The other important algorithm is uh, quantum Fourier transform. I'll skip that. Uh, that uh, follows directly from uh, um, um, uh, Simon's algorithm. Uh, but it's, it's uh, in some sense more, more applicable to a lot of other applications. So I'm skipping all this. And uh, in recent years, there's been a, a, a resurface in the interest in quantum phase estimation. Uh, there's been uh, some work done in, in looking at uh, uh, how you could estimate. Uh, uh, so you x on this, Let's say uh, the, uh, the, the unknown function here is an eigen state of u, then uh, you would like to find out, uh, and, and this, of course, uh, this u is a unitary, so the eigenvalue is of the form e to the i theta. You would like to, to, to compute what is theta. And so the basic idea is that you can sort of uh, go through this entire circuit on its own. Uh, run through this circuit, and you'll find that by measuring all these bits, that corresponds essentially to the, the binary expression of theta. Uh, so you express theta in terms of binary zero point. Uh, is, is a fraction of two pi. So let's assume that theta is a fraction of two pi. Now this fraction is estimated by measuring by this all this measurement here. So the, the digits corresponding to the fractions can be measured. And of course, it depends on the precision you want. So if you want higher precision, you will need more and more of these lines uh, as you go. But if you, uh, so if you have less lines, you will lose the precision, but then nevertheless, you can estimate the, the phase. And this uh, quantum phase uh, algorithm is used uh, in recent year by Jung Sook, and, and Nicola uh, uh, for looking at um, how to calculate a molecular vibrionic spectrum, and uh, which is a very interesting sort of work. But a lot of this uh, involves um, uh, looking at uh, 
the phase and calculating the phase needs if you can see from here you need a control you get another control you get so in in essence and together with the quantum Fourier transform this is not a simple machine and uh, currently of course um, with our noisy quantum computer uh, that we have uh, from Google or IBM this is an almost an impossible task if it is uh, sufficiently simple even for a sufficiently simple molecule so they show that you can use uh, uh, the this to uh, to to extract the form. Now, so quantum computers in the end have been shown to be much faster, and they can solve some problems that are too difficult for classical computer, and they can also break cryptographic system because of short algorithm. Now, the question, of course, is uh, um, so this is just about Shaw algorithm. Um, this is just a, a sort of a digression in some sense. Uh, talking about Shaw algorithm, why is it so important? Is because multiplication is easy. Typically, if I give you 13 times 17, you can tell me it's 221. And then uh, factoring, on the other hand, is typically hard. So if I give you 221 and ask you to factor, uh, typically, it's very hard to tell for you to tell me what are the two prime factors, even if I tell you that there are only two prime factors. And let alone a number like 624691, uh, what are the two prime numbers whose product is exactly this? And that is generally difficult. So you have an easy way of encryption and a hard way of decrypting. So if you make encryption, that is based, basically based, fundamentally based on multiplication and decryption based on factory, then you can see that one way to, to uh, encrypt a message is easy, but to decrypt is hard. But of course, if you know the factors, decrypting is not, not more difficult. So, uh, so this is uh, how we, we end up with uh, the, the fact that uh, this, easy multiplication and hard factoring process allow us to invent a key that makes a messages safe. As long as factoring is hard, all messages remain safe. But remember, Peter Shaw uh, came up with an algorithm that can do prime number factorization more easily. And so this break uh, caused a lot of problems because then now you can break this 624691 very quickly, which means no messages become safe. So uh, in recent years, of course, we do have the quantum computer. By the quantum computer, we have a noisy. So we have uh, imperfect control over the qubits. And the noise, in fact, uh, plays serious limitations on quantum devices. and. And so we, uh, John Preskill, whose picture is here, uh, actually says that you, let's coin the term noisy intermediate scale quantum computer and see what we can do with this limited number of qubits, typically between 550 to a few hundred, and what, to, uh, what can we do with it? Now, surely we cannot do quantum phase estimation. That's too difficult at the moment. Uh, can we do uh, some miracle? And, and the thing, of course, is that um, uh, we, we try, uh, there, there are now uh, a lot of work done on what's called so called NIST compute computation. And what NIST computation is, is that you solve the problems that are relatively tractable on the classical computer, and you do all the problems that are tractable on the quantum computers uh, allow them to, to perform those single qubit operations or measurements and or preparation of states, uh, put it back to the classical computers, uh, uh, do some measurement and put it back to the classical computers, allow the classical computers to do those uh, optimization problems, and then you produce the result. Of course, it's only a temporary solution. With 50 qubits, you can certainly do uh, quite a bit if not all. 
So the the fundamental uh, variational quantum algorithm, which I think I just give, you know, I didn't give a, a reference to this. Uh, so this is in preparation of a, a paper that we'll be writing, uh, but it's available on the archive. So if you uh, search for uh, for preprint, you'll see this. Uh, the idea is, is in a variational quantum algorithm, uh, which means that uh, you do state preparation on a classical uh, on a quantum computer, uh, and 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 this this. This uh, involves uh, some uh, typically some measurement, and then uh, you do some. Uh, the output of these measurements goes into a, a classical computer uh, that optimizes it, and this optimizes uh, 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 temporary optimized parameters, are then fed back into the uh, parameters of the unitary gates within the uh, quantum computer, and this whole. Uh, classical quantum loops uh, is iterated several times. Now, the variational uh, eigensolver uh, uh, has actually been, uh, in some sense, uh, 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 done uh, by by the group of Mang Hong, um, where they actually uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, estimate uh, this. Uh, energy um, essentially is to find the ground state energy. And uh, uh, there is um, the idea that you can actually do some of this on the classical computer and the, the, the some part of it on the quantum computer. Now, one of the variational quantum eigen solver is, uh, is, is, is like so. Um, so there are two, two uh, NIST algorithm that's pretty popular. One of them is what's called the variational eigen solver. The other one is the uh, QAOA, which is the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. And uh, what it does is that uh, in the case of the the, uh, the variational eigen solver, what you typically want to do is to uh, 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 prepare some some Hamiltonian, encode it in some Hamiltonian, and then prepare some state corresponding to the estimated ground state of the Hamiltonian, fit it into a quantum computer, does some measurement, do some classical optimization that is actually fed back uh, several times into this uh, quantum computer, and then you evaluate the, the ground state. Uh, same thing for this, uh, which is typically used for uh, what's called the max cut problem when it was first introduced uh, um, a, long, uh, a few years ago, uh, was to consider an objective function, which is uh, essentially your Ising model. And you can actually show through a series of mathematics, uh, not that difficult mathematics, that you can prepare the state as a uh, superposition of the plus states in the four qubits. And then through a series of uh, estimator, uh, you then estimate uh, uh, the, you you can then estimate the, uh, 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 the whether it belongs to one portion or the other. Notice that um, in this max cut problem, if uh, if uh, one and two are related, uh, and this uh, sigma one and sigma two are up in position, then this uh, sigma one z and sigma two z is exactly one for classical. Uh, statistics, and so the cost function is zero. But if they are not, they are opposite spin, that, for example, then it will be minus one, and then your cost function become one. So minimizing this cost function allows us to distinguish whether they are connected or not, in that sense. So I'll skip the mathematics behind, and variational quantum simulator is uh, is um, oh uh, is is another NIST algorithm that uh, we have proposed. Actually, it's, uh, uh, one of my students has proposed um, this uh, algorithm. Um, oh, this is not. This is the variational quantum simulator, uh, which is used for solving uh, a master equation rather than uh, 
uh, unitary uh, evolution. So that that is uh, done by uh, one of my former students, Ying Li, uh, who worked with uh, Simon Benjamin, and they came up with an algorithm that can uh, that can solve a master equation uh, with a quantum computer. Um, it is not obvious that you can uh, solve this uh, with this computer, but nevertheless, uh, it is closer towards uh, the realization. And of course, recently, uh, one of my other students, two of my students, uh, came up with an algorithm uh, that uh, you can prepare a state uh, uh, as a k-moment state expansion, uh, fit it into a quantum computer, and the quantum computer only does single qubit uh, rotation, single qubit rotation, and you do the measurement, and you fit the uh, measurement back to a classical computer to solve an equation that is derived from this answer. And you optimize this, and then you fit it back to the quantum computer, uh, readjust the, uh, the, the state preparation, and then fit it into the computer, with single qubit rotation, and uh, you do the measurement again, uh, do the classical computation, and then uh, that this goes into an infinite loop. And uh, it is shown that in some cases, I, I, I do not claim that in all cases, uh, uh, this uh, quantum assist simulator will produce the right uh, uh, the, the, the optimization for you. Or for example, the ground state. Now, uh, this k-moment expression uh, actually stems from uh, a mathematical theorem uh, that's Krylov subspace. And what Krylov does is that uh, uh, you can see from, uh, that you can always expand uh, uh, your, your, your estimation as, um, as some initial estimation and some uh, uh, polynomial expansion of the estimation. In, in the particular case here, the spanning set was, uh, if let's say the Hamiltonian is, is uh, sum over uh, Pauli operators, then the spanning set is just all the po possible Pauli operator or combination permutation of Pauli operators. Now, uh, of course, the, the question is, uh, what happens if the, uh, the, this, the set of Pauli operators become exponentially big and and of course the that that is one reason why uh, uh, this technique might not particularly work so well in some cases but in other cases it will work uh, according to uh, a base and pre loss of space and we have extended to some these algorithms uh, for uh, uh, quantum uh, for the simulation of Hamiltonian uh, as well as for the time evolution, uh, instead of using cauterization. And also for uh, uh, some uh, computers with uh, feedback loop so that we can uh, find the uh, uh, correlations, uh, uh, estimate the correlation. And in uh, the last few uh, weeks or so or months, uh, we have come up with another algorithm uh, based on, essentially based on the same idea uh, for quantum, um, for semi-definite programming. So it's a solver that is uh, essentially, we call it quantum semi-definite programming, but uh, it is um, essentially is a, is a hybrid uh, computing system where the computer does all, uh, essentially all the unitary uh, evolution and the classical computer does optimization. Uh, the, Preparation is still uh, uh, according to the same answer, which is uh, uh, based on the uh, superposition of all the uh, possible permutations of Pauli operators acting on some uh, uh, vacuum state, uh, I mean zero state. Now, uh, we showed in this paper in particular that it, it can help to solve uh, a lot of semi-definite programming problems on uh, partly on a quantum computer. So uh, of course there are challenges. There are uh, a computer as we have now uh, is still in this blue region. 
we have less than 100 qubits. Uh, if you are uh, uh, paying attention to the progress in this field, you'll see that uh, just recently they have uh, claimed that they have performed, uh, the Chinese, for example, have performed some experiments on 62 qubits, uh, um, a quantum walk algorithm. And we now know, of course, on a whole list of algorithms that stems from essentially four algorithms that we know of. And uh, there are, of course, uh, other algorithms uh, that, that do, do come in. And of course, the quantum computer has been uh, extended to um, that uh, there, there's still efforts trying to find the proper material. Uh, currently, the, the favorite one is superconducting qubits, but that's not the final goal. Uh, John Martinez, for example, has decided to move into silicon, and silicons, uh, he thinks that silicons is hopeful, but uh, there are definite uh, experimental and technological challenges. Um, there is a problem with quantum error correction. Quantum storage is still not uh, fully uh, soft. Uh, we have some uh, papers on that, but it's, it's not a fully solved problem. And how you can interface classical and quantum is, is also a big area. So at the moment, in terms of quantum computers, there are still a lot of problems. And also in terms of platform, there are, there are various platforms ranging from uh, superconducting to ion trap to, to silicon. But of course, um, although quantum computers can be difficult, um, there is no nothing to prevent us from talking about uh, uh, an analog machine that mimics nature. And that's called a quantum emulator or simulator. And we have been working on a bit on that in the past. And this is some, some work that's done on uh, waveguides, but it's not the only type of simulators that you can find on the market. Uh, in recent years, there's what's called optical lattice that can sort of manipulate the neutral atoms in order to find, uh, uh, to simulate some chemistry. Now, so let me go through um, a bit of history. The 19th century industrial revolution uh, has in fact, even rise to the Babbage machine. In fact, had it not been for the emphasis on steam engine and, and mechanize, mechanization, uh, Charles Babbage would not have thought about building or dreaming about building his uh, analytical machine, which was never built, actually. He got a grant for 10,000 pounds from the British government, but he delivered only a piece of paper. But nevertheless, that piece of paper was so important. He has a prototype, which he showed to other levelers, but uh, it was uh, not a complete prototype. Now, nowadays, uh, there is a real prototype based on his sketches, but it is uh, a few hundred years after his uh, ideas came into fruition. So the whole idea was the need for accurate tables, trigonometric table, tables on the tides and uh, table on interest rates. And that led, in fact, ultimately to failure because nothing was really built. By then, uh, with the exploding population in the United States in the late uh, 19th century, uh, there is this um, uh, need for sensors and so mechanical machines were built. The hollow rate machine was the first one. And that led to uh, uh, the, the uh, tabulation machine and say, people say, okay, so sensors is not the most important thing after you have solved it. Uh, perhaps we could focus now on another problem. So let's uh, focus on the real road problem. Uh, and it turns out to be a failure. So the first and second world wars all contributed in some sense to the building of the ENIAC. Now, ENIAC needs a lot of funding. It, 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 it in fact, uh, shut down the whole of Philadelphia I think, when it was first built. So it needs a lot of energy as well. But um, um, where does the money come from? In fact, a lot of the money was siphoned off 
from the United States during the First and Second World Wars. In the second, First and Second World Wars, Americans got involved in the war and um, they had to do to, to fund the war effort in Europe. And uh, a lot of money was spent to, uh, to invent machines that can calculate the trajectories of, of, uh, of cannons and, 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 and all the other uh, military devices. And, and that led to the invention of Enya. And the Univac was subsequently invented. And one of the successes of the Univac uh, was actually Eisenhower, prediction of Eisenhower election, which to, for all practical purposes, is not a very important thing. So the need for firing tables, cracking codes, the need for to predict Eisenhower elections, all these, and subsequently the need for space race with the Russian uh, uh, led to, to somewhat the, the invention of the current uh, computer. So a lot of money was involved and all this money came from a uh, uh, crisis in some sense. So we need crises to build computers. So the question now is, what are the major crises that we have now at the moment? Uh, perhaps it might be the race between China and the, and the United States. Perhaps it might be the race between Russia and the United States, or maybe the three of them. But eventually, or even, even India comes into the picture. So um, this, this is a crisis that when government sees the need to pump money, uh, something comes into fruition. Then there's of course the quantum simulator, uh, quantum analog, when is it going to be built? Um, so it's a chicken and egg problem as well. When is quantum cryptography ever needed? We know quantum cryptography can be bought off the shelf and it is pretty reliable. But the uh, question is, when do we ever need it? And what are the outcomes of the current industrial investment in quantum computer? What if they all fail? So, and finally, is there a good quantum material? So these are questions that we have to uh, at this time. Now, um, just as a last bit, uh, running short of time, uh, is this idea of, um, of binary. The computer that we have now is based exactly on binary. And that came a long time ago from Leibniz uh, in, in the 18th century or 17th century, um, where he said the explication of the uh, arithmetic, uh, binary arithmetic uh, with only zero and one characters uh, uh, has a, a lot of uses. And in fact, he attributed to uh, ancient figures from uh, Fusi. Uh, he, he wrote Fuhi by uh, the uh, ancien figure, uh, Chinois de Fuhi, but uh, it's actually Fusi. Uh, Fusi is, is, is a person on this right uh, who has invented what's called the I Ching. And that's uh, many thousands of years before. And the way you read this, of course, is that uh, this is zero, zero, zero. Uh, so uh, a, a long stroke can mean uh, one, and uh, uh, two short, short dots can mean zero. So one is uh, zero, 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 one, uh, zero, one, zero, or something like that. And these are just basically binary. Uh, and that about accounts for this anagram. But there is, Actually, another uh, representation in mathematics, modeling, and computers, and that's called a unary. Means instead of having two characters, you use one character. And what's the use of characters? Unary, in fact, is very much like the Chinese character for one, two, and three. One meaning one stroke, two meaning two stroke, and three meaning three stroke. And in the ancient Babylonians, you actually have a unary representation. One is one of this character, two is two of that, and they just count. Um, but uh, of course, it's not the most efficient way of representing numbers, but it exists. And so uh, this winery computation was uh, 
recently uh, proposed uh, by a group in Spain to, to do uh, uh, option trading. And the paper that they have uh, appears here. So quantum ordinary uh, operate, uh, approach for option trading. And so the whole idea is that uh, you, uh, you, you actually encode information by passing a photon, just one photon. So you have, let's say you have uh, N of these waveguides or N of these inputs to your computer, quantum computer, but you only have one photon in any one, at any time, you only have one photon. So it's either zero, uh, one, uh, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 or, uh, or if this uh, ray dot goes up there, uh, it is one, zero, zero, zero. Now, so you would think that this is a really lousy way of depicting uh, information, but nevertheless, if you allow this to go to a quantum computer, you find that you can proceed with amplitude amplification, just like binary uh, zeros and one, and you can perform it faster. So the idea is that we could do it on waveguides, integrated photonics, and uh, and uh, in fact, at the moment we're trying uh, to to work towards. So I think that's it. I think I've more or less exhausted my time, and I hope I give you a survey of what is needs computing, and and, and also hopefully some uh, quantum computing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for this very interesting and beautiful talk and with some historical perspective. And there are many things we didn't know actually. We came to that. Yeah. Very, very uh, many, many different pictures and the ancient Greek and ancient, uh, I mean, the ancient pictures in the quantum computing. So is there I, must, I must apologize if it's not, well, it, was, it wasn't meant to be technical. Yeah, it is so, not technical, but uh, actually in quantum computing, I think hardly there is no talk. This is maybe the first talk in quantum computing, uh -huh, uh, real okay. quantum computing. So students are not that much familiar in this topic, I think. Okay. So uh, is there any question? No, 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 I don't think, no, I don't think there's no question. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you, you guys should ask questions because when you ask questions, even if it's vaguely related to the yeah, topic, I mean, nothing is naive question. So you can ask any questions. For example, yes. what is this picture? This is also a question. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, it, it's sort of also uh, put you into the mode of uh, doing further research because yeah. a research topic starts with a question. Yeah. So you need to ask a lot of questions when you do your PhD, for example. Uh, yeah, asking the right yes. question, of course, will give you, yeah. may yeah. even win you the Nobel Prize. <laughs> but uh, ask so questions. Just ask a piece of curiosity. This, what happened to this, this machine, the, this ba ba Babel? What was the Babbage name? machine. Babbage machine. What happened to it, this machine after all? So the Babbage machine remains as a blueprint. Yeah, it's a blueprint. So and, anyone has built this machine later on? No, no one. No, no, he did build a prototype. This is and you kept it at home. And uh, he showed it to Ada Loveless. And, yeah. and she was uh, very intrigued by it. In fact, yeah. uh, Ada Loveless uh, actually went to uh, Charles Babbage house several uh, times uh, in order to look at the machine. Okay. But like what she says, uh, I think she said something to the fact that she uh, didn't. So, so what happened was that uh, nobody in England appreciated. Yeah, even but, by uh, it turns out that somebody in Italy was uh, very intrigued by it and uh, actually wrote an article on it. Uh, uh, and what Ada Loveless did was that she expanded on the article because the article was a little bit crypt in detail. Ada mm. Loveless knew about the Babbage machine. Mm. And at the uh, encouragement of Charles Babbage, she mm. actually translated mm. the Italian paper to English. English, okay. And the translated version was a lot thicker than the original article. Okay, okay, okay. okay. So in fact, we now learn a lot from Ada Loveless. So then people have appreciated that award, right? 
there is no question. Yeah, that's How a good question. How can we use quantum computation to simulate some quantum gravity related experiments? And is the NIST quantum computing suitable for simulating relativistic? So, so at the moment, any realistic uh, simulation uh, is rather difficult. Uh, I would say on the current noisy quantum computer. Mm. But that does not, when you talk about simulation, then that brings us to the analog machine. Now there is a chance that by understanding or looking at co atoms moving in uh, optical lattice, there's a chance for you to map that system to a gravitational problem. Mm. And there are in fact efforts in that direction currently where they do map uh, into, uh, in, in fact, they, 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 they look at it as a, a, a microscopic LHC, like Hadron Collider. And, and in that sense, you could study a lot of the collision problems right now with, uh, with neutron by low, low energy. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. So, so this is possible. Yeah. So the noise quantum computer, so when we are talking about NIST quantum computing, we are talking about digital computing. And mm -hmm. at the moment, I think it's still very far away from simulating relativistic systems. But there are uh, analog machines. Uh, Colin, I think I met him before. <laughs> uh, uh, is there any classical algorithm which is, uh, which by using classical correlation has improved its performance? Is there any? Uh, this is in the classical. So you're asking if there are any classical algorithm based on classical algorithm, correlation has improved its performance. Um, maybe, but it would still remain classical. I would change the question to, is there any classical algorithm which mm -hmm. by using quantum correlation has improved its performance? I think this would be a very meaningful question. And I think uh, uh, I am not sure if there is one yet, uh, but uh, certainly those, uh, let me think. Mm. So the Google experiment, which was uh, highlighted to have quantum supremacy, and I don't like the word quantum supremacy, I always replace it with quantum advantage. Uh, has has um, essentially classical correlation by using quantum computer. So they were trying to show that with uh, with uh, with a quantum computer, you can produce classical correlation that are much better than a classical computer producing those correlations. And but the, the margin for error is not a lot. So for example, if the classical correlation produced a, a number one, the quantum was producing something like 1.06 and uh, it wasn't that convincing. So at the moment we don't, yeah. if that's uh, How do we practice and implement the gamma factor from the noisy channels, for example, amplitude? Um, Typically, uh, uh, any noisy channels will have to be uh, implemented with strict physics. So you can actually invent, uh, 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 invent a master equation where the gamma, I, I, pre I believe this is the gamma D of A that you're talking about, uh, for example, in a master equation. Um, uh, this gamma, uh, can be invented by implementing uh, more qubits and tracing them out. Then you find that you have uh, in the process event, uh, uh, put in a gamma factor within the actual system. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the whole idea is to expand your system. Oh, yes. So I think I'm back to in uh, Vietnam, if I'm not mistaken, or even before, mm -hmm. Colin. And the question remains, what exactly physically a channel is? 
this. What what is uh, physical channel? Yeah. What uh, exactly the physically the channel is? There's a confusion from the, from the student. I mean, they have. Well, physically, it just means uh, um, physically. If you um, think about it, it is to mimic uh, classical uh, errors. For example, your classical errors of uh, beep flip. Mm -hmm. uh, can be mimicked on a quantum computer. Uh, and a quantum computer also suffers from bit flip errors. And this is exactly what happens. Yeah. Uh, um, you, you are trying to big, uh, mimic uh, bit flip. But of course, for a quantum computer, uh, aside from bit flip, you also have what's called phase flip error mm -hmm. because zero plus one can change to zero minus one. And uh, zero plus one and zero minus one are orthogonal to each other. Mm. And because they are orthogonal, you can distinguish them fully. So it's like a, a zero becoming a one, as mm. good as a zero becoming a one. So you have to take care of phase flip okay. error in, in, or relative phase error. Mm. Uh, and, and so uh, uh, a channel that, that describes B flip and phase flip or both mm. is sometimes called a decoherence channel. And uh, physically, of course, that happens in the computer itself through the gate. Mm. And uh, whether or not you can describe it exactly with that is, a, is another question. Yeah, so we are just describing it mathematically. Actually, everyone is a lemon question every time is that when we how will have the quantum computer? Uh, what is your, your take on it? In 1946, somebody asked the question, when do we have a computer? Uh, Somebody would say that in 50 years time, we get a computer that is uh, sold to three customers. <laughs> in fact, I think that remarks was made by somebody. Okay. okay. But uh, it turns out that in 50 years time, we have a computer that is sold to more than 50 customers. Mm. In fact, billions of customers. Mm. In fact, by 1980s, you start, uh, you start to have a, a personal computer. Mm. Yeah. So, so it's a matter of... Uh, uh, technological advances. So it's very hard to predict. Yeah. But I'll say safely another 50 years, we can have a quantum computer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's not, not in our lifetime. Yes, yes. I don't expect it to be in our lifetime. But for the young people there, it may be in your lifetime. <laughs> and it will become dangerously, uh, uh, yeah. It's just an opportunity. Every crisis is an option. Mm -hmm. I came across uh, many papers and articles about quantum computing based on entanglement or using entanglement, but can we use this code for quantum computing? As it is more robust than entanglement. Okay. Now, it is not obvious that a quantum computer needs entanglement. You might be surprised with this, but uh, Yes, it is. It has not been proven. Mm. Um, so we take it that things that are now proven stands unproven. So we don't know. Uh, this court, on the other hand, is something that I was interested in at some stage. Then I lose interest because it was shown that almost every state has non-zero this court. The, the, the set of states with zero discord have measure zero, mm. which means that they are like integers mm. in, in the, on the number line. So you know that number line has many numbers, right? mm. real numbers, but the integers are point on the number line. So they are infinitely many, but they are discrete, discretely many. So it has been shown that this chord uh, is uh, it's got measure zero on this set. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I'm very skeptical about using this chord for quantum computing. Although it has been shown that any machine with non-zero this chord can compute the trace of a unitree uh, matrix uh, better than a classical computer. Uh, it's called a one, uh, one DQC, yeah, mm -hmm. one this discrete 
uh, quantum computer. Um, it is, so uh, what I would say is that if it's a zero discard, it's also not very useful. And um, by then there are not that many states. So you essentially any compute, uh, uh, any uh, quantum states can be used for quantum computing. That's what you're saying. And I think because I'm not sure if, uh, in fact, this, this one DQC is the, the issue that casts doubts on the, the need for entanglement. In fact, what they have shown at that time was that uh, there is a machine that doesn't have entanglement at any time, but you can compute the trace of your unit tree much faster than a classical computer. Right, much faster, you better come. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, in that sense, it's, uh, it's still an open question. Yeah. Right. So is there any more, guess, more, more questions? I guess I'm also infringing on your time. <laughs> no, it's okay. It says we have uh, 10 more minutes. I mean, five, at uh -huh. least 10 minutes. Yes, not a problem. So... If there is no more questions, then uh, we let us thank the speaker once again. It was really awesome talk, as the student said. It was really beautiful talk. Thank you very much, Professor Quick. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Yeah, I would love to be in partner, but um, I've missed yeah, that love. chance please many, us. many times. Please visit, <laughs> visit us once. Yeah. When these things normalize, visit us once. Yeah. yeah. Are there, Colin is not in partner. Colleague, no, no, it's yeah. Not. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay, it's a wonderful okay. researcher. Yeah, okay, 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 okay. okay. Bye -bye. We'll see you sometimes. Okay, okay. let's we'll see when. Yes, yes, okay, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Say goodbye. Oh, you are here. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. forget to, I mean, uh, <laughs> Dr. Chen, are you around? Was quick. No, I think he left um, just. Okay, I, okay. Oh, you are here. Okay, I thought maybe you were not here, so I. No, no, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay, I will go privately. Okay. Okay. In fact, I was away just came back. Okay, okay. So I maybe I thought maybe you were going to be busy in a meeting. So I. No, I was. I was. I was. Okay. Just, just to see that things are over. But uh, yeah. okay, I will. I'll send you a private email. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> So we'll take a five minute, maybe two minutes break. Maybe Stefan is not here yet. So then we'll come back again. <laughs>